Well, there are many issues that the public could be on, but I suspect that the fact is that nuclear weapons are still a topic of discussion simply because even a single explosion could create a catastrophe in any nation. Uh, we saw the bombing of Nagasaki and Hiroshima at the end of World War II and the total devastation. The, the weapons that are now available and have been for some time are really much more deadly and more comprehensive in their destruction. So this needs to remain uh, at, really at, at the center of attention of the nations of the world, and I think does really, even though there are not uh, the formal conferences or negotiations that might be desirable. Well, the buildup of nuclear weapons in the United States and the former Soviet Union uh, continued really with uh, quite a pace and with considerable expenditure by both nations. Uh, the idea was that uh, the nations really could develop enough weapons to destroy not only the armed forces of the other, uh, but uh, likewise threaten to destroy the cities, the basic civilization. Uh, this was not an objective of the United States to destroy anybody, but we were clearly wanting to counter what we saw the buildup uh, in, in the Soviet Union creating. And this led to all sorts of informal discussions, some maybe more formal than others over the course of time, but without really uh, stopping the pace of that buildup. Oh, I'm certain there were many currents in post-World War II that led to really a definition of territory. But um, the, the weapons business was simply behind the scenes of whatever diplomacy was occurring, but a very deadly way of, of, of noting the importance of a nation. For the Soviet Union, the buildup of those weapons was the key critical factor to that nation not only being taken seriously, but that nation really having the power potentially to dominate the continent uh, as well as to control the United States. I'm not privy to what occurred during the Reagan administration entirely, but President Reagan was encouraged through some talks in which he was engaged, or his associates, that the Soviet Union might be prepared, really, to come into some sort of talks and negotiation. There had come, I think, to be a sense of how awesome the power of all of these weapons were in terms of potential destruction of both the United States and the Soviet Union, uh, but the rest of the world. Uh, however, those, those talks did not lead to any particular action un until, uh, as I recall, uh, about 1986. Uh, at that point, um, President Reagan was encouraged enough that uh, negotiations started in Geneva, Switzerland with the Soviet Union. Uh, I was a part of those situations as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. The idea, uh, and President Reagan was wise to do this, was that a bipartisan uh, group of senators should go to Geneva to back up what was occurring, at least with our professional negotiators. Uh, President Reagan felt strongly enough that this was sort of the moment of decision that uh, a two-thirds vote would be required in the Senate. And therefore, a bipartisan group of senators would be required. And the leadership of the Senate went, as well as those who were chairs of Armed Services Committee, Foreign Relations Committee, Intelligence Committee, and others. Uh, it was um, an exciting moment, although a disappointing situation. I remember the late Ted Stevens, a uh, senator from Alaska, was optimistic enough about this. He rented an apartment in Geneva, anticipating he was going to be there for some time. 
and the thought was that the senators would participate in those conversations, even if not in the formal round the table negotiations with paper in hand. Unfortunately, this was not to be the year, but it was uh, an important year for me because I got to know uh, my colleague, Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, who was to become chairman of the Armed Services Committee of the Senate. And uh, Sam and I went over to the Russian consulate and visited with some Russians, got to know some folks during that period of time. So that by the time we had left uh, Geneva without a treaty or really without any particular progress, uh, we had made some acquaintances. I wouldn't call them friends, but acquaintances. And uh, these were uh, citizens of the Soviet Union with whom we stayed in contact during travels, during Senate recesses in the subsequent years until 1991. Uh, and we had a sense from those conversations that things were not going well in the Soviet Union. And as a matter of fact, uh, by the time we came up to the end of that decade, it was apparent that the potential for the Soviet Union collapse was at hand. But um, 1991 was the critical year uh, in many ways. In that particular year, Russians who Sam and I had been visiting with came to Washington. Uh, we met around a round table in Sam Nunn's office and I cannot repeat the entirety of the conversation, but certain parts of it remain very, very graphic in my memory. I remember one of the uh, Soviet delegates looked at me straight in the eye and said, you Americans have got a lot of trouble on your hands. I said, well, what do you mean? And so he said, well, uh, the facts are that, um, unfortunately, the guards who were manning many of the stations where the weapons that are aimed at you, that is the United States, uh, are located, have been deserting. In other words, these weapons, transcontinental uh, weapons of mass destruction, may have no guards on them. And there could be an accident, uh, quite apart from a terrorist or somebody getting into the situation. Um, that really would be a horrific problem. And uh, so in any event, I said, well, what do you want from us? And so they replied very rapidly, all of them, your money. We're going to need a lot of your money. We're bankrupt. You've got to understand that. We can't pay our guards. And uh, we need really some technicians to work with our people to take down the weapons, take the warheads off of the missiles, and, uh, to begin to take the nuclear material out of the warheads. And um, so this really was the beginning of the discussion of the non nuclear Cooperative Threat Reduction Act. It came uh, likewise with great assistance from Ash Carter, former Secretary of Defense, but then at the Belfer Center at Harvard, who came to Washington in a very timely way <clears throat> at our request and uh, had a so-called white paper, which um, described really what needed to be done in legislation quickly in order for the United States to be active in this respect. Uh, and so we gathered together, once again, a bipartisan group of senators for breakfast to hear Ash Carter and to discuss all of this because we were already well into September, as I recall. The uh, Senate was going to adjourn, clearly by the end of November, uh, to get legislation passed of this gravity in that period of time was going to be an awesome task. But in any event, uh, we gave the non uh, amendment, and it was an amendment, not a specific bill, uh, to one of the appropriation situations that was going through the Senate, and uh, got into debate, and it passed 86 to 8. But now without a great deal of commotion, which the small minority vote represents, a good number of senators said, not a dime for the Russians, they don't deserve a dime. Well, this uh, legislation had more than a dime in it, about $150 million was uh, to be committed because that was the money that was going to be required to get the Russian scientists and technicians, quite apart from all the logistics of Americans working with them, to begin taking down the weapons, taking the warheads off, and this sort of thing. Um, 
Uh, President uh, Bush signed the legislation, and eight days later, the Soviet Union officially collapsed. And, and at that point, of course, it was a different ball game altogether. But um, it was a, a situation in which uh, the Russians ha had all these weapons. But as I've described it, they did not have really the technicians to keep them or the guards to guard them, uh, quite apart from what the military situation might have been. I certainly hope there is not a new arms race on the horizon, although uh, there are some uh, folks in the United States who unofficially suggest that uh, we really ought to be countering this with future developments. Uh, I think that this is a sort of sub rosa debate uh, that goes on, uh, but clearly there, there has been uh, some commotion over the fact that um, Perhaps uh, much smaller nuclear warheads uh, could be developed, uh, that they could be deployed in all sorts of ways. Some have suggested, as a matter of fact, that as opposed to having nuclear installations that are fixed, that could be targets uh, from uh, Russian forces, uh, all of our nuclear weapons would be on submarines or on craft that are mobile and uh, therefore could not be hit in the same conventional way. Uh, at this particular point, thank goodness, the United States has not progressed, to my knowledge, uh, into a competition with the, the Russians on this respect. I'm not aware of how far the Russians have progressed, but it is a conversation that occurs from time to time, and, uh, and it's one that uh, really deserves attention. It would not be advisable for the United States to unilaterally disarm. We are still at risk, not only uh, from whatever might be occurring in Russia. We, after all, we still have the New START Treaty, but it expires uh, in, as I recall, uh, about th two or three years from now. And at that point, the, the Russians would still have if I remember correctly, 1,550 warheads, at least that was provided for in New Start, uh, that is a huge stock of, of armament. And uh, to, to unilaterally disarm, while uh, Russia has 1,550 warheads, uh, it does not make sense, quite apart from what it may be occurring uh, in, uh, in situations such as Iran or or North Korea, or other countries that may attempt really to break out of a non-proliferation treaty. I'm not certain how, how the calculus has, has changed. I, I believe that there is a desire really to hunt down all the potential for danger and to, to try to develop intelligent sources at home and abroad that are going to be helpful in this respect, that simply goes without saying. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful that we are being very successful in that pursuit because it is really very important that we know really uh, what's occurring not only in uh, Iran or in North Korea, but in the United States. Well, the uh, Congress uh, committees now that deal with uh, military matters are certainly uh, active, but it's really not clear with the, the current administration what sort of conversations go back and forth between the White House and the leadership of these committees. I think it would be uh, more comforting if we had an idea, really, of really how our government works right now on these issues. I would suggest that it's very important, as a matter of fact, that the um, chair of armed services, uh, uh, formulations of intelligence, various committees of that sort, in the House and the Senate, 
have regular contact, not only occasionally with the Department of Defense, with the Secretary, and, and others, but likewise with the President, that there be conversations, a uh, round table, in which we have understanding of who is doing what and what would be desirable, really. I'm not certain there was ever a golden age of this sort. I think that from time to time there have been periods in which sometimes because of the personalities involved, there has been greater communication, uh, greater activity. I can remember from my own experience a large number of meetings at the, the White House when I was a very junior senator with President Reagan. Uh, these were discussions that were very substantive. And that, uh, that continued with other presidents beyond that, but those were vivid in, in my mind at that particular point. I can remember uh, at least uh, opportunities with other presidents uh, to, to have discussions that were not quite uh, so frequent. But at, uh, at the same time, this has always been something that was never prescribed. It, it happens because of circumstances. It probably would be healthier if, in fact, there were regular times and schedules for communication.